in the future um, on different topics here and there. But um, you'll see my face soon enough. But my name is Finn. I'm the lead online game art teacher. And basically, I'm going to be going through a little bit of a workshop using the Quixel Suite, um, which is a plugin uh, available inside of Photoshop. So to get things started, I'm just going to switch my screen so you can see my face. So welcome. Um, so over the next 40 ish minutes or so, uh, we will be covering the Quixel suite and basically um, showing you some cool tips and tricks. Uh, ultimately, this level of, uh, let's just say this, let's just say that the, um, what you, all you need to know is basic uh, knowledge of Photoshop and you should be good and dandy because we're basically going to go through the basics with inside of the Quixel suite in order to show you what you can do with it. Um, so it's not a super advanced tutorial, just more of just a kind of relaxed, casual one and we'll, it will flow in the direction on uh, which way we take it pretty much. Um, so uh, yeah, other than that, yeah, this is the Quixel suite uh, website. So this is where you can actually get it. Um, I am going to be primarily using uh, Endio, which is a fantastic application that, well, plugin in other words, that allows us to generate normal maps with inside of Photoshop and also procedurally generate them through a texture rather than what the normal workflow would be, which would be to make a high poly um, mesh and then bake down to a low poly mesh and then put it onto an object. So if you're still not sure with that technical uh, garble that I just said, just said, um, is a normal map, basically what that does is if you're playing any sort of, I guess, let's just say a video game in other words, and you're walking around the world and you look at a wall and the wall is more detailed than it actually appears to be uh, while you're looking at it. So when lights flick past or uh, shadows, etc., they cast on the wall, but the wall's actually flat, like it's just a flat polygon. So we use this uh, technique inside of 3D and just gen games in general uh, called using normal maps. And a normal map, when applied to a surface, obviously, if done correctly, what it does is during lighting calculations of the actual game or 3D application or whatever 3D render that you might be using, um, it perturbs the normal, uh, the surface normals of the surface of the object during the lighting calculations to give the illusion that the object is actually more detailed than it actually is, but it isn't. It's just a kind of a trickery with effects. So we use normal maps pretty much in all industries, in other words, in different parts here and there. Um, but for me, I'm primarily going to focus basically on um, uh, putting this into a game engine, which will be Unreal 4. Um, I've already got uh, some examples that I've already created just before. So ultimately, um, what I'm going to be doing is basically sorting out some nifty tricks and tips that you can do inside of Photoshop so you guys can do that too. And I can see the stream is working because I can see five viewers, which is fantastic. So, hey guys, I can't unfortunately see the chat. That is uh, my marketing assistant that's around the corner. He'll be kind of giving me the heads up if I um, if you guys say anything, but basically I'm going to charge on through this entire little sort of webinar in other words. Um, so, uh, by the end of it, I might have some time for questions, but if not, it will be basically just plow on through and create some cool stuff and come out with it with something kind of nice. So nice. So other than that, let's flick to Photoshop. So I've actually got Photoshop already set up and basically with that, uh, we have, uh, uh, NDO basically already opened because I've got like this uh, from a previous um, uh, like working on it just before this workshop. So what I have here in front of me is a normal map. It looks like a little rainbow sort of texture that you see here, but all these little pixels that we see kind of here with the colors across the actual the model and such. Um, uh, tell during lighting calculations uh, which way the face, uh, the, the illusion of the face yeah, when the lighting goes over it, uh, which direction it's facing in general. So as we can see from our little 3D viewer right here, if I just maximize this, and I've got the light spinning around it, we can see that we have um, the illusion that this object is actually more detailed than it actually is because ultimately it's just a flat plane like this. So I'll just show you look yeah cool 
So I'm just going to pull that down there and I'll change it back to something fancy wancy. Looking at this. Um, and because how um, NDO works, basically what I do is all of the Photoshop tools that you generally have in Photoshop, uh, majority of them basically are integrated into this plugin, which is NDO. Um, and all I need to do is simply click a button and then uh, straight away we have uh, results on the other side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off from scratch. And if we don't run out of time, I'll end up defaulting back to this one to put into the game engine finally. But if we just go file new, and make a new um, texture. So I want it 1024 by 1024 because that's the that's a nice square size. And that's what game engine specifically I want, a power of two number. Um, other texture sizes will be 512, but 1024 is a good number, so we'll go with that. Um, and you can see it hasn't updated completely, but all I have to do is simply uh, hit this little button that we see here. So actually, I should actually close everything down so we can reopen it. So when you're using Photoshop, basically all you have to do is search your computer, because once you've installed uh, NDO, you can basically um, open it up and it'll uh, open up inside of Photoshop and be appear as this little kind of list here. The current version I'm using is 1.8. Um, and we have ov obviously the other uh, little software plugins that come along with the Quixel suite, such as DDO, which is procedural texturing. Uh, we have Megascans, which hasn't been released yet, but it's basically just high density data of um, uh, scanned in uh, PBR sort of uh, materials into that you can use inside of your projects and such. But that's yet to come out. You can look at it more on the, their website. Then we also have 3DO, which is our 3D viewer, which I had just opened up just before. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on NDO and I click on that this little button and it should pop up this little tiny um, little UI. And because I have a blank canvas at the moment, um, it's basically saying to me, oh, do you want to convert this into a normal map? So if I hit this little button right here, it'll do some kind of crazy stuff on the side and it'll generate me um, a kind of a, a blue sort of teal sort of canvas that we see here. And the cool thing about um, NDO, and I'm going to show you how easy it is as well, is that all of these little uh, tools that we have on the side of Photoshop, such as a marquee selection or like the lasso tool, even painting something or uh, maybe even a gradient could possibly work. I haven't actually tried that one yet, but um, also like text, splines, shapes, all of that stuff. Uh, once you draw them on the canvas, they basically become uh, a live object that we can tell or talk to NDO and click a button and it will automatically convert it into uh, a normal map readable format inside of Photoshop because we're doing this all in Photoshop. Um, so when I click that button, it's basically convert my canvas into a blank normal map canvas, but there's nothing actually there because I haven't actually put anything there. So I guess I'm not going to really particularly create anything magnificent at this point. I'm just going to show you the different tools so that you can go, oh, okay, that does some of that kind of stuff there. Um, but if I click on the marquee select tool, for example, which is just one down and I just do a random selection just like that. And you see the little dotted lines that we see there. Um, you'll see automatically, it just takes a little bit, but under the little NDO plugin, it changes to say, oh, do you want to make your selection into a normal map? And if you, all you do is just hit that button, it does some awesome kind of loading on the side and the layers. And then we've generated, uh, this little perturbed or basically extruded surface that we see here. Now it doesn't look much because it's a 2D image. So in order for us to actually see the actual results in a properly like a, a well lit way is that's when 3DO comes into um, action. And that's actually the little application with the three next to it. If you click on that, it should load this little 3D viewer. And I've set up my um, Photoshop so I can actually see all things at once. Generally your Photoshop window is maximized, but I just couldn't see everything with my little 3D view open. Um, now, as you can see, like I've opened up the 3D view, but nothing's actually happened. Like I've just seen the sphere and I'm like, what is going on? I'm so confused. Well, all we have to do to actually refresh the update from what we've just uh, inputted into Photoshop to actually input into, um, uh, to view it in 3DO, which is inside of Photoshop, um, is if you look in the little NDO little drop down that we have here, we can see this little kind of arrow that's kind of spinning around like a refresh icon. And if you click that, you see it says force 
uh, force a refresh for 3DO. When I click on that, huzzah, we got some results. If we actually maximize that, you can see there's my, uh, my lovely kind of extrusion popping out of um, our sphere. Now, you might not exactly want a sphere, so there, because these pro, because these plugins, uh, NDO and 3DO, are technically separate, but they work in conjunction with each other. I'm just going to maximize the 3DO viewport and show you some of the stuff that it has uh, that you can enable and disable and play around with it, so you can get some cool results. And then we'll go back into the actual normal map uh, creation because we, in order for us to understand, I guess we need to also understand how the viewer works in order to view it. So if I just maximize this up and we have it right here, if I tap the spacebar key, um, it has options that appear up on the side. We can change our object to a chamfer box, um, a cylinder, a plane. We also have the option to put our own mesh, but I'm just gonna leave it on a chamfer box because it looks kind of cool. And I'm gonna hit also, uh, go down these, these options that we see here. I'm not gonna go into too much depth because most of them are pretty self-explanatory. The other ones you can just go in and kind of play around yourself and figure out how they all kind of come together. But um, just a basic rough overview. Uh, you can apply a mesh rotation, which is kind of neat. So you see how it's still at the moment. So when I hit this apply mesh rotation and I start moving this, I can move the object around and rotate it. I can also um, basically left mouse button click onto the actual canvas here and rotate my model that we see here. I can also use right click to zoom in and out. Basically you have to just uh, hold down right click and move forward and backwards and it actually uh, zooms in and out. And middle scroll click pans, just kind of like a piece of paper on the desk. It pans um, yeah, your model around like as if it's uh, just a piece of paper on your desk and you're sliding it around. Um, but you can actually do this right here if you want to apply a mesh rotation. Um, the benefit of applying a mesh rotation by just playing around with these values, if you see, if we have X set to zero, it's stationary. And as soon as we start to move it, you can see it slowly actually starts to rotate. And it's helpful in a way that you can actually see, oh yeah, that's my whole model as it's rotating around and what it looks like. But generally I don't have that turned on, so I'm gonna turn that off. Um, I generally go all the way down to spin which actually spins the lighting. Because as I said before, normal maps are calculated during the lighting calculations. So I really only care pretty much about what it looks like when the light is uh, basically bouncing off it and to see if my normal map is reading correctly or do I need to adjust it, etc. So I can go down to spin, click on that. And as you can see, the light is kind of rotating around. You can also change the default sort of like the lighting setup with the HDR that's set up inside of Quixel. So I can click on it if I get different lighting scenarios. It doesn't really matter which one you use, it still looks pretty nevertheless. Um, and then if we continue go all the way down here, you can add in your diffuse, your specular, your gloss, and there's all this other stuff such as um, taking nice high res screenshots or adding little cool things like, um, let's just find something neat like depth of field, like look at that. So it's got all this nice stuff down here that you can play around and you can actually take a nice screenshot of your, um, I guess your normal map on this 3D model, or which, whichever 3D model that you might have down the bottom. You can also turn on lens dirt. So if I just turn off depth of field just for a sec, um, it's kind of hard to see, but it is there. Um, unless my screen is actually dirty, but <laughs> Oh wait, we can intensify the dust. There we go. You can kind of see that kind of paperly sort of dust. It kind of looks cool in portfolios. Um, but once again, I'll suggest you guys to kind of have a look through these. I'm not really going to focus too much. All I really care about specifically is more of just the, um, the actual outcome for our uh, normal map, in other words. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink back down my um, 3DO previewer. Uh, just shrink it back down so it's down here. I'm gonna hit space again. Um, so I just see my kind of model down here. And now we're gonna focus back onto the canvas, which is the most important part. Okay, cool. Uh, one thing to kind of note and uh, point out that you might experience when you're running this program yourself is when you convert one of the layers, if you don't have it in the correct order inside of the, the actual layers right over here, um, basically it won't uh, 
display properly. So if I just show you by going down to the layers and if I use the eye icon to turn it on and off, we know that that's our box that we created. If I drag this above our normal thing, you see it goes kind of a weird color. And that is just because in order for our normal to work, it really needs to be in between this little three star little uh, icon that we have here and this little um, color background right here as well. So all of our files of all of our stuff should be in between there. However you organize them, uh, it's up to you. Um, but generally, NDO organizes it for you. Um, the first layer right here is the general background, as we can see here. So it might be a good idea to just call this background. And we can test this if we turn it on and off. Oh, actually, it doesn't have anything in there. It's this little image right here. Yeah, that's the one. Got muddled up there. So we're going to just call this like box, for example. So you should always name your layers because it gets quite, uh, let's say, um, quite crowded um, with your project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer by going down to the bottom right hand corner and clicking on the new layer icon. And then I'm going to show you some cool stuff. So I'm just going to hide that box layer because I'll or probably just delete it. It might be easier. There we go. So I've just created a new layer and just generally how you actually add to your actual, um, your NDO uh, canvas in other words, or your Photoshop canvas. Um, Keep in mind that how I'm producing these normals is I'm showing you how to do a normal from scratch. Um, you can have the workflow, which I'll show a little bit later, why I have uh, some rock and some grime and stuff like that, how to generate it off a texture. But I'm basically going to be replicating what I have here uh, and basically just going through and seeing how uh, we can create some, an interesting sort of design of something. So I'm just gonna go back to my black blank canvas and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you some tools that we can play around with. So any of the selection tools, like if I was to do a sphere, and if you hold down shift, it does a unified sphere, if you didn't know that, or if you let it go, it kind of, it's, it's flexible and kind of goes up and down, but holding down shift basically keeps it all unified. And when I let go, once again, NDO over on the side basically goes, oh, yep, that's a, you can make, turn that into a selection. So we can click that automatically generates me a, um, uh, a, a normal map in the layer um, that I can edit. And if we have a look in these layer settings, you might've been wondering what do they actually do? Well, I'll just go over them and then we'll go through the rest of the tools here. No, I'm kind of segueing all over the place, but I guess, cause it is live, we'll just kind of go with the flow and whatever works, we'll just continue with that. So I can change uh, the size as you can see. So I can make this really big and notice that in my previewer, which I'll just try and make a little bit bigger and more noticeable, um, you can see, and I'll just speed up the light so it's speeding just a little bit faster. Let's see. There we go. Cool. So you can see it actually changing, not going too slow, but you can see it's automatically giving the illusion that this is actually 3D. But then when, of course, we look on the side, hey, look, it's actually not really 3D. It's just uh, an illusion. Um, so we can click on our folder and with our folder, it depends on which folder you select, which depends, uh, which uh, shows the outcome of how you can edit that file. So if I just quickly just create something, because that probably did not make sense, if I create another one just really quickly, and I just created it just then, and we've got two little bubbles now, which is awesome. If I just make this uh, like huge, humongous, giant rivet of some sort, um, you might notice that when I have folder one selected, I am changing. Uh, or layer one, sorry, layer one, I'm changing the layer one's options. Um, I can rename this by double clicking in the actual um, NDO little uh, graphical user interface. And I can write this as like nub or something. I'm just gonna call it nub. And if I go to layer one, you'll see that the options suddenly change. Cause if you pay attention to the size right there, you'll notice that when I click on nub, See, it's flicked back to 64. So I'm editing this one. If I go back to this one, um, it will flick back to 23. So I can go in and edit each individual one really quickly and it updates and changes as I'm going on the fly, which is extremely useful um, and it's extremely handy. Um, another thing to kind of point out, which I actually experienced just before this session when I was playing around with um, uh, NDO just for the, while making this little thing right here, um, in earlier versions of NDO, you could actually hold down Alt and clone uh, your layer and it will keep all of the stuff from that layer. 
and make a duplicate. And then you can change the settings up inside of the NDO little uh, user interface. So I want to demonstrate something of what not to do, but I'll just show you. So if I just drag this, if I hold down Alt on the keyboard, notice how I have layer one selected, which is all the folder icon uh, contents. If I open this up and clone this across, um, we'll find that it's made a perfect duplicate. Now this may or may not work, and depending on how punishable, I guess a live stream would be, but let's just see if this actually works. If I start to change um, my options, and notice how I have layer one copy selected, and if I hide it and unhide it, we can clearly see it's the second, it's the second sphere that I've cloned. If I just start changing it drastically, it actually does nothing and it changes its original that it was copied through. Um, in earlier versions, uh, that wasn't a problem. It might be a bug, who knows? But the way around that is I'm just gonna delete that uh, layer, delete its group and contents, um, is I'm going to click on layer one, which is at my sphere that we see here. And then I'm going to basically go over and click on uh, this little drop down menu. It's like kind of like Unity, in other words. It's got a little arrow and little four little lines on the corner. If we click on that, we can see down here under edit, there is duplicate. Um, I've tried using the hotkeys as well, but they sometimes don't particularly work. So I generally go through this menu, even if it's a bit tedious, maybe they'll fix the next patch. But if I hit duplicate, it'll duplicate it and I can move it off. Now crossing fingers and it'll be embarrassing if it didn't work. Yay, there you go. So I'm updating layer one copy and it's not weirdly updating the previous one I've duplicated. So not all, um, let's say Photoshop shortcuts perfectly work uh, with this um, uh, plugin, but I'm sure that later down the track, the Eva patch, it'll add new features in and stuff because uh, uh, the community is fantastic and they do listen to the community uh, tremendously. Um, so yeah, that's just one thing to kind of point out that if you don't uh, duplicate your layers properly, it doesn't necessarily mean that NDO is going to pick it up and understand what you're doing. Um, so cool. So while I guess we're on here and we continue down, we've got depth, contrast, opacity. If we play around the opacity, obviously it changes the opacity of the model or the, the normal. Um, so you have all these options that we have here to like play around with the size and etc. Now, as I said, I'm not going into too detail or too much detail with the actual how to uh, use every single tool inside of NDO, but I'm just going to show you the useful ones that you can get some happening and going uh, straight off from the bat. Um, you might have noticed that these, these big buttons along the top here, where we've got shape. And if you click on that, you've got smooth, chiseled and chiseled shallow. Um, it's going to be very hard to see the differences in depending on how, if I change the fall off and how it changes particularly. But if I basically click on shape and change it to chiseled, you'll see that the actual slant. And if we have a look in the 3d viewer, it looks like it's being chiseled, even though I'm zooming right in and it looks all kind of pixely, we can just see that it is changing the actual, the shape of the model or oh, not the model, the actual normal itself. If we change it to chiseled shallow, and it's more smoother, as you can see here. So it really comes to you on what you think works best for whatever you're trying to accomplish, of course. <clears throat> so you can also go to the bevel, and this is actually how the object is sticking out of the object. So I'll just zoom out, and we'll just have a look at our object as a whole, and I'll do that to the 3D model viewer as well. There we go. All right, cool. And if we change the bevel, we can go outer and it may have not really done anything. It has pushed it out a bit more, but if you start playing around with these and go down, let's say groove, we can see instead of, and if I just hit the refresh icon, because once again, if it doesn't update in 3D viewer, you just need to hit this force refresh and it should update or not. <laughs> let's see if we can get that to refresh. Let's close that and open it up again. Error in Photoshop has occurred. Functionality of this option may not be available in this version of Photoshop. That's unfortunate. Okay, that sometimes happens. Alrighty. Um, so we'll just get that back to where we had before. Hopefully it doesn't crash on us. That won't be, that won't be fun. Um, all right, so if we just zoom in, we can see it's actually updated. Sometimes it does happen because uh, ultimately you're actually forcing Photoshop uh, particularly 
uh, to do some pretty cool things. Because if we look in the layers down the bottom uh, here, when we draw an object or shape or anything like that, it basically um, creates lots of little sub layers using the, um, what's it called? The blending options, that's right. When you right click on a layer in general and it generates kind of the visual effects that we have here. <laughs> um, so yeah, awesome. So if we just basically uh, go back into this and um, <laughs> Michael's taking photos of me. <laughs> All right, so if we just go back into this and we can play around with this, if we just go to bevel, we can change the groove. Hopefully it's gonna update. Crossing fingers. Oh, I'm editing the nub, <laughs> the completely opposite thing I don't want to edit. Control Alt Z. Um, cool, and make sure you have the layer selected because if you don't have the, the folder selected, it's not gonna do exactly what you want it to do. And yeah, cool. So if I just change this and go, let's say stroke outer, um, yeah, okay, it's updating now. So it's just changing how the actual, um, the bevel itself, how it ex extrudes uh, in uh, simulations space inside of Photoshop and how it actually gets represented. Then we have this really awesome one right here called slant. And this is probably the most useful that you're gonna be using uh, heaps. Basically you can go slant up or slant down. So if I change it, instead of it pushing outwards, it has the illusion that it's pushing inwards, as we can see. Just turn on that spinning thing. Maybe that's what crashed it. <laughs> um, cool. Um, you can even change the curve. So bevel was basically how the, the, the outer stroke, how, what does that look like? Like the, the rim going around it. And basically the curve, that actually in a way is a more in-depth way of looking at the, how the actual uh, curve is generated when it pushes it out. So we can change to any one of these and get some interesting results. I'm gonna probably change to something just random and see what it looks like. There you go. So this one with a little swirly little valley high, we can see that it has the um, kind of like a little indentation in there. And if you think of this in an aspect of modeling inside of a 3D application and etc., cetera, um, all of these things that we're doing here, we're doing obviously live and I can edit them at any point, make, stretch them out, make them thicker, make, make, the la make them larger, smaller, etc. create nuts and bolts, really easy. But what you would have normally had to do is go through in a modeling application and model that these details like the groove coming in and then bake that out. The thing with NDO is it just kind of skips the fourth wall and we basically can do, we can rapid prototype our normal maps if we're doing that, of course. Of course you can do it for different ways um, and basically get results really fast. So your boss could basically walk in and go, hey, I need that changed. Can you change it? And you're like, sure. And you open up the file, switch it around a little bit and then show it to them. And they're like, yeah, that's good. And you can probably even sit down with them and adjust it with them. And it's not too much effort and not too much uh, uh, I guess problems that you can really uh, experience. Um, and the last and final little button that we have right here is uh, the blend. Um, the blend is basically very similar to what you have for the layer. If we look back down in the layers, right down the bottom, we can see that we have um, uh, normal. If you click on like, well, this is the little layer, layer blending options. So if you cycle through these, if you've been doing texturing, it helps you blend textures between using different calculations and procedural sort of methods to actually blend the two. Um, we have the same thing inside of uh, uh, NDO. And the benefit of it is if you change the overlay, notice in the center of the screen, the normal map, if I change the overlay, we can see that they're now blending between each other. So it's really handy in other words, because we can change to like soft light or we can change how I want it to vivid light. And, and it gives you very drastically different results, which is awesome. So you can see this one's very nice and sharp looking, uh, but generally normal's good. But if you're ever, um, I guess, overlaying something with multiple things and you don't want to accidentally like uh, cut off this awesome circle as well, and you want to blend the two, that's what you do with these blending options that we have here. Now there are some more options down the bottom here where you, if, uh, that I recommend you guys to try out such as the sculpt mode and like you can zip it up and stuff like that. And sculpt mode means you'll, it allows you to paint the normals uh, uh, dynamically on the actual canvas itself. Um, but other than that, uh, we've kind of gone through a bit of like this. That's all we really need to know with all these uh, little settings right here. 
From what we know now, we can basically create something like this. The only thing that you probably don't know is how do I make all these cool, awesome shapes that we see here? Um, really any image or uh, thing inside of Photoshop, we could just hit a button and we can convert it. So let's, uh, let's do some, let's do that actually. So da, da, da. I am going to go show you the, um, the lasso tool. Obviously any of these tools of selection you can do. So I can draw like a squiggly line and bam, I can turn that into a, a normal map. In other words, or an extrusion of some sort. Doesn't mean it's actually gonna look good. So we're just gonna delete that. Um, I can paint as well. So if I, I have to make a new layer, of course, remember keep it between the two layers down the bottom. And if I paint, and it depends on the color you're using, and we'll soon find out if we hit that. Now, if that happens and it vanishes when you paint it, it's probably because I was painting black. You wanna use a different color to black. Um, so hopefully Photoshop has not just crashed. Yes. There's always a kind of uncertainty when, um, if Photoshop <laughs> will just crash at any moment, if you try it, cause I'm, I'm running like the stream recording it locally and I've got unreal and all the other programs running in the background. So there's probably a chance. Hopefully it doesn't just like over like crash and burn or anything like that. But, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change from painting black to white and see what happens. And look, it worked. So that's another actually thing to look out for. So if you're painting in a dark color, general black, it doesn't read the value or doesn't convert it properly. So as soon as you paint it uh, with a, like a high, uh, basically white, in other words, um, you can actually paint your effects and actually create them and they'll turn into something. So of course, any of the brushes you use inside of Photoshop, they all can be like kind of stamped and you can turn them into a normal map. It's really easy. Um, so if we just continue down, uh, let's, hmm, let's play around with the pen tool. I love the pen tool. Pen tool is your best friend. It's one of the coolest tools ever, but I can make a cool wanky sort of shape. And then da, 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 you can see uh, Quixel's like, oh, yep, you can turn that into an actual shape. We've got this and ta-da, and it works. Cool. Although that when you convert it, you do lose the ability to edit. So you can always hit control alt Z to remove like step backwards and basically redo it again. If you want to adjust it or make different selections and stuff like that, uh, to change it up, you can also use text. So I can click on this and call this like danger. Oh, I've got the perfect font like stencil. Um, and if you use control T, it basically turns it into, um, uh, transform where we can change the size. So there's our danger right there. Once again, hit a button. Look at that. Looks great. We've got danger appearing up here and uh, we can change the size. We can make it thick or we'll thin it down. Um, my best advice I would say for normal map creation inside of NDO, what normally what the, the casual user could possibly end up doing, um, is that they over excessive push the values really high. They see values that they can change and they just start throwing them to the right. So for the size, they'll generally go, oh yeah, we'll make it 19. And it just doesn't look right. It doesn't seem to match the actual object. So sometimes it's always good to go by subtle changes is probably the best. So even all these little scribbles I've done already, they're very intense. So it'll look a bit odd, especially when you're in a normal map, you want to make sure that your normal maps that you're creating are very well polished and they look very simple and they well not look very simple. They're just, you can't look at them and understand how they've been made. If you are a three artist, so you look at that and go, how did they make that object? And that's what you want to get out of your models, a question rather than um, a problem. So cool. Uh, so if you just basically drag this down, so I'll say subtle changes in other words, and hopefully, whoop. Photoshop's freaking out <laughs> because I'm changing this all live and it's doing uh, uh, pretty much active feedback. I have the risk of crashing. So always save and do backups, of course, with um, NDO or just in Quixel in general, in general, of course. So yeah, subtle things. All right, so that's text. Uh, and the most useful one that I use mostly in that little panel that we had there is we can drag shapes out, which we can hold down. We can make like a custom arrow or something like that. That's right down the bottom. Uh, if you hover over like little shapes here, it's like custom shapes. That's what it's called. If you go to the little squiggly icon up the top of um, Photoshop, you'll see that there's a shape icon and you can click on this and you can get some really nice, simple shapes 
But ultimately, as I said, you can get something from um, the internet. You can create it your own. <laughs> I love how it's freaking out of that. Because I haven't turned these into a normal map, you see it's gone all reflective. So you gotta make sure they're all turned in or hide them. So I'll get rid of those. But as you can see, all the different shapes turn into stuff and it's pretty useful. So I can kind of do anything that I really want. It's pretty much up to my imagination to what I actually want to end up creating. But all these tools, especially the shapes are really useful. And I'm gonna show you why. So I'm just gonna hit no and kill um, that document right there. But if I go back to the one that I showed you guys at the beginning of the stream, and I just, hopefully if Quixel wakes up, all right, there we go. Yep, there we go, there we go, we can see it. Um, you can see that all, these are basically just made up of simple shapes. This is just an interesting panel. It was like, yeah, we'll just play around with the different, all the different types of, uh, uh, I guess, modes that you can go through. And then we're just gonna post those up or try them out and play around with them by pushing them in and out and stuff. Cause you can see, if we look closer to this, uh, this tile right here, we have um, it pushing out, then pushing in, then pushing out, and then the little bits in here are pushing inwards. Um, and then we've got another pushing in, and then we've got a custom shape from a marquee selection. And um, all of these shapes we can use uh, con the transform. So basically when you go edit uh, free transform, which is control T, uh, you can change these and make them to whatever you want. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to go file new and create just a new document. Remember in pixels, not centimeters or anything like that. I'm gonna go, yep, I want this into a normal map. I'm gonna do its thing. I'm gonna click the shape and we're gonna make something. So uh, let's just go down to the shapes. I'm gonna click on this rounded uh, rectangle tool. And before I actually do anything, I can just drag it onto the canvas and I'm like, cool, that's it. But as you notice with Photoshop, we can actually customize the edges and how the curve inside of Photoshop is actually generated. So in order of just doing a general box, we can make an interesting shape um, if we wanted to. Um, and of course with that, I'll just convert this to see if this works. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I just wanted to make just a general box, but I'll go back to that tool. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this on the outer edges. So I'm just gonna use Control T. And because it's a shape, it's a, it's a smart object. I can kind of scale it, drag it around and press enter like that. And if I refresh it on this uh, preview, it doesn't really look much. We'll just change it to the plane. Uh, we can get like a nice simple tile. Maybe just hit Control T, just scale it in a bit by holding shift and snap it to the center of this, the, my little panel right here. So we've got basically just uh, a square right there and I've left space here. So this could be as easy as doing a tile for a surface of a bathroom. We've already got pretty much the step that we need. Because all we, we can do is in a way, instead of making this uh, 1024 by 1024 for the size of the actual image, we can actually um, make it, let's say 256 by 256 um, import it into the uh, Unreal and basically just tile that image multiple times. So we're not actually texturing the whole floor with um, one giant small grid to represent the bathroom tiles. We just only need to make one and then we just tile it and have it as a small texture source, uh, basically conscious of our texture budget that we have for a game and um, uh, make sure that we're uh, utilizing as much procedural sort of methods inside of, um, I guess our game level. Um, but anyways, let's just continue on. That was a bit of a tangent, but if I click on um, my uh, little cube again, my chamfer box, I like to call it a chamfer box, because that's what 3 ds Max calls it in their program. But instead of me just drawing that shape like this, I can basically, before I do anything, I can go up here and we can see, we can set the width and the height. Generally, if you click anywhere in there and then just left click um, on the canvas. So if I just click on any of these numbers, it'll come up with a little options. You saw that when I did create it before, it already had us options that pop up on the side. So I could say, I want this hundred pixels by hundred pixels wide. And then maybe I want uh, the side, the, the right bottom corner to be kind of rounded a little bit more. So you see how these are 10 pixels? It means that it's 10 pixels in order to round the corners of our, um, our little object that we have here. So if we hit okay, we can see from that, it's hundred pixels by hundred pixels wide and I've made the rounded corner right here. So we've got an interesting shape, very similar to what I 
I did right here. So it's just playing around with them and getting something that looks all right. Convert into a normal map. Now you see it's gone to a different color, meaning that my layer is just incorrectly ordered. So I'm just gonna click on that and drag it down. And then I'm just gonna move it up here. And I can use Control T, scale it out if I really wanted to, play around with it. Um, I can also, uh, once again, if you wanted to make a duplication of this, you'll have the layer selected. Click on these little drop down layers, that we, oh, drop down little settings here, and we go to edit and go duplicate. Um, it should automatically duplicate and it'll be sitting on top of itself. There we go. So I can hit Control T again, and then just hold down Shift and rotate by clicking on the outer edges of my Photoshop. And I've got already um, some sort of interesting sort of shape and design that we have here. I'm just gonna adjust this one. Even holding down Control and, oh, whoops, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> just click on the layer and then move it. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, and then I can just kind of go around and like create another shape. Just I'm just making, I'm just playing with my imagination right here. I guess I can push the size so it's more thicker. I can change it to slant inwards. Um, and if you see my panel on the side here, it's slowly becoming to build and have its shape and everything. I can then basically go in and, um, oh, what can we do? Let's just, let's open the polygon tool. Let's change the sides from up in the tool settings to the top to three. So we get a triangle and we're gonna drag that in and I'm gonna hold down shift so it stays perfectly straight. Just gonna turn that into um, an object. Now, generally, if you're designing your, um, your panel or your sci-fi panel, like I was doing with this other one, um, the one thing you want to speak, uh, just basically thinking in the background is consistency and uh, foreshadowing through your models specifically. Uh, specifically, sorry. Um, so what you want to think about is different types of shapes that repeat throughout your model. You don't want to throw uh, stars, hexagonal objects, squares and all that kind of stuff all at the same time at your model or your, your concept art or anything like that. You, if you look at like movies, let's say um, Up, uh, that's done by Pixar, if you look at the two, at, right at the beginning of the movie when we, um, uh, we basically are introduced to the main characters and where they fall in love, if you look back at that movie and kind of look at the foreshadowing they have through that movie, you find that the female side is all circles and ovals and round. And uh, Mr. Fredrickson, Mr. Fredrickson, sorry, um, he's basically all squares and I guess chamfered edges kind of thing. And when the uh, when they're both in the same, let's say, photo on the wall, because all the pictures are all uh, ovals or shapes, etc. Um, they, it's kind of like a mix between an oval and a, a, a square, but all of that adds character and adds purpose into the world. Cause if you just have lots of shapes, like this random triangle, this triangle might, might not exactly specifically work, but as long as I continue maybe using this triangle throughout the design, if it's a very large part of it, it'll actually balance things out a little bit better. But if it was something small like this. I don't think I would really have to worry, but it still can look out of place, in other words. So I'm just gonna leave it here and we'll see if we can work with it later. Uh, maybe just make it look like a play icon because that will look so cool that who wouldn't want a play icon? It's kind of off, it's kind of off straight now. Uh, it's okay, I can always redraw it. But I'm just gonna add some sort of grid sort of feature here. So I'm just gonna go to my um, rounded edges uh, for my object, just gonna draw out a shape. Now, another thing with uh, using Photoshop is after a while when you make lots and lots of shapes, it's basically gonna start to chug your machine. So I recommend if certain shapes are specifically the same, I suggest to actually combine them all so that you can actually get uh, a desirable result and you can customize one and it'll do all of them at once. So for example, this rectangle shape that I just done here, I just wanna do some sort of grid line here gonna hold down alt, which I said don't do for the um, the folders, but for just general shapes, it's fine before they're converted. If I hold down alt and hold down shift, it should snap perfectly down. And I can maybe move it 35 pixels if I really wanted to, or I know that the first one, I didn't really get particularly perfect. And we can have that. I can just delete the first one, save the problem. Oops. 
select all those. You can select the first layer and hold down shift and select the ones down. But if you just go down there, um, and then what I'm going to do is with them all selected, I'm going to right click on it. And what you want to do is you want to hit merge shapes and that will turn it all into one shape. So when we hit this convert icon, it'll do them all at the same time. So now we've got this kind of little panel that we have right here that's coming together. Nearly coming up to an hour already. Okay, cool. So um, I can play around with this, figure out which I like. Should I have them indented? Should I have not have them indented? It's completely up to you. That's the purpose of the whole point of playing around with these. Should I have them just a groove? Should they just be a little line like this, changing the bevel and how they extrude? Or should I change how they blend? It's, it's the great thing about um, NDO is you can just basically workshop this as you're going, get feedback from your work, uh, your colleagues, etc. But the best thing you could possibly do, which I guess I'm not really doing at the moment, which is very naughty of me, um, is to look at reference. So to have reference of um, inspiration near you, not simply Googling, I want to do a sci-fi panel, because uh, you'll get very generic, like people think sci-fi panels just actually very similar to what I have right here. But you want to think outside the box, like how can you do interesting shapes? Um, so maybe I could go in and go to my, um, my lasso, polygon lasso tool. And if I just close that down and if I hold down shift, which should do straight lines and perfect, I think 30 degree, um, selection. So if I hold down shift, so you see how it's snapping, it's going snap, snap, snap. I think it's, yeah, it might be 30. Um, and you can look there, you can make interesting design shapes really quickly. I remember I'm, I'm still holding down shift. And there I've got this interesting sort of slant, slanted sort of shape that we have here. Rather than just a generic box, we're changing things up a little bit and we've got um, little shapes that we see down here. Um, so yeah, and of course you can go around, grab other different layers, move them in, maybe have another sub shape that's in here. Like, why not? And of course, I'm just, I'm doing this quite quickly. So if, uh, I guess, forgive me if it's not looking 100% perfect or amazing at this point, but um, we're gonna probably use the other one, which I'd spend a little bit more time on. Oops, nothing has happened. Okay, there we go. So because I did it underneath layer, I just need to drag it on top of it. So it's visible. There we go. Now I'm just gonna hit exit. And we're just gonna change this layer to be like slanting inwards. So now, hey, we've got like this little panel right here. So in other words, when you've got something like this, you can continue on plugging along, changing the different shapes, etc. You can also use um, Adobe Illustrator, which I have opened at the moment right now to actually get some more unique shapes. Uh, Cause you might find that the shapes inside of Photoshop might be very difficult to manipulate, but it depends on your creative mind. Of course, if I just create like, let's say a square and I wanted to make like a radioactive symbol, so I'll just make my square obviously a different color. There we go, green, awesome. Um, with Illustrator, if no one's ever used Illustrator before, um, it's definitely awesome because it's basically vector graphics. In other words, we're working in vector. We're not working in pixels like in Photoshop. Unfortunately, NDO does not work in Illustrator, but a lot of the shapes and stuff we can create inside of um, Illustrator. I can click on this object and I can go, let's add an effect Let's add warp and let's add an arc. And when I, and you can see in this options, you can see all these different options of distorting our image it kind of reminds me of old Microsoft 2002, but yeah, you have all the different things. You can make a fish, you can make a flag, you can make an arc, you can have the arc here. And if we're trying to mimic, let's say the hazard symbol, like say for like, uh, just like the nuclear symbol, you'll do that using an arc and you can just basically adjust these if I adjust the right one, of course. Oh, I need to tick preview like a Muppet. I didn't click that. <laughs> yes, there you go. So we can get like the, the shape. We can make it like an interesting wipe like this. Maybe you're not doing a sci-fi panel. Maybe you're doing a, a futuristic or more of a, an architectural achievement, uh, office space. That's not, that's has the nice kind of awesome shapes going through. We can generate these through uh, Illustrator really easy and I can hit okay. And then there's my shape. Now, if Photoshop and Illustrator are fantastic, I should be able to copy paste this and put this into the Photoshop's so if I Select my layer and go control C 
And then if I don't, I'll just manually rip it out. But if we go back to here and we go uh, control V, as you can see, it says paste in as a smart object is exactly what you want to do. There's our awesome shape. Now let's convert it. <laughs> and there you go. The first error of today. <laughs> oh, Quixel. <laughs> Oh, uh, we'll, just, we'll just have to continue with that one. That sometimes happens. It gets to a point where it freaks out. Um, it would have actually converted and made it a nice shape. What I probably should have done, however, is basically probably deleted the stroke, uh, made the stroke non-existent, so it's just a shape. Um, if anything did go wrong, like let's say if it didn't like the smart object, what I probably should attempt is rather than just simply basically, um, uh, let's just say, uh, getting the shape and basically importing into Photoshop uh, directly, I can probably save out this as an image and then cut, extract it, cut it out, and then we have it there and et cetera. Um, and then re-import into Photoshop. Um, but hopefully NDO has not completely destroyed itself because that would be unfortunate. No, it seems to be still functioning. It just has lots of errors now. Um, what I'm just going to just briefly show you now is some other things that NDO can do, which is really fantastic. So we're showing you how to generally create a normal map uh, from scratch, just creating extrusions, pushing it in and out. And we can see in the 3D viewer, it basically representing um, our, uh, our model, kind of what the final result will look like during uh, lighting inside the engine. But if we have a look at it right here, we can basically just go and I want to put this one into the engine because we can do it to any of them. But if we have an image, any image that you might have, you can basically, you can click this little uh, drop down menu on the corner and down uh, right here, we see photo normal presets. If you click on that, it gives us a whole bunch of presets that we can automatically click as, uh, as a preset. In other words, then it will detect and read the image and do its best to generate it to its, those preset settings. So all of these we see here, we can see that there's like full spectrum, height, medium hazards, small details like uh, fabric, uh, asphalt, brick, stones, grass, etc. Uh, you just want to find the closest one that will match what we have in the background here. So it, it's all depends, I guess, which one you want to pick, but I am probably going to go with hmm, uh, smooth erosion. That probably looks good. You click on that, you can either automatically do it through an, uh, a file so you can upload it and then basically convert it automatically. Um, you want to make sure that your object's tileable for me because I've actually made this tileable. So as you put this next to each other, they seamlessly continue across. But you can also do it from the active dock. We can do it from the clipboard, which is basically the control C. Um, and you don't want to bevel the edge because that will cause weird results. So I'm going to make sure it is tileable because it is. And I'm going to click active dock and it should do its magic. And if you look at the previewer, because I've actually got a diffuse kind of loaded in or an albedo, it kind of looks nothing at the moment, but it's still generating our normal map and hopefully it doesn't crash because that would be so unbelievably disappointing. But that happens. Let's just see it do its thing, might take a little bit. There we go. And if we have a look at our 3D viewer, it has automatically generated us all this detail procedurally from the texture detail using those presets that we chose. And of course, I can go in and edit those presets up the top here. So you can see it's got fine details, large details, smooth. If I play around with these like fine cracks, it'll update up on my actual file here. So with Quixel, it's a very powerful tool that you can generate normal maps off textures and stuff like that. But what I'm going to do now to probably actually wrap things up because we're a little bit over time. Um, but for the course of this, we're going to import this into Unreal. Um, and I'll just use this texture because we can do it to any of these, but it's entirely up to you. Uh, yeah, we'll, pro we'll probably just show you w one more thing, I reckon, just to kind of show you something cool. So at the same time, where I can, um, I'll just refresh this sort of updates. There we go. I love how it's got the texture applied to it now. <laughs> All right, cool. That uh, was close 3 video. 
Um, now, if I, if I, let's say, look at this model right here for the one that we started off where we had nothing, like for example, this one, all I've done is just push them in and out, change different shapes. If I click on the little drop down, and instead of clicking photos to normals presets, I can click on map converter. And this is pretty nifty. Um, so basically, what we can do is we can convert our normal map into an ambient occlusion, a height, a hard, like basically a height kind of rounded, a height hard surface, a diffuse, a specular, and a cavity. And you could use this if, let's say, you started off building your normal map from scratch and you haven't done your texture yet. You could basically just hit, oh, I want to have an AO. And if I click on this and go active doc, it'll duplicate my Photoshop document. It won't override it. And it'll generate me some basic AO that we can see here. So that, that can, in a way, be my texture. If I really wanted it to be my texture, I can use that. Unless you wanted to... Um, have this real time in the engine, but you can put this in the texture if you wanted to. So I could basically, uh, I could just open up a new layer and we'll just do a flood fill or something. Um, let's just get a paint bucket and we'll flood fill it with something like gray. Or let's change the color to uh, probably something like a little bit whitey or something like that, a bit of blue. Um, and I'm just going to change the um, the layer blending modes and we'll just filter through the one that works best for us. That's generally what you do most of the time. Just filter through until you find something that looks good. So I'm using the arrow keys on my keyboard and it's changing the filter modes for the layer. Okay. Oh, that one's all right. So linear burn looks all right. I'm just going to change the opacity, kind of bring it down a bit so it's more white. But I can use that as my texture. Maybe I didn't want to use the ambient. I could basically go back if it lets. Where is my tile? I've lost my document. Oh, it's hidden. <laughs> it's all the way at the back. All right, so I can just go to this one and go, I want to convert this one too. We'll convert it to a diffuse. This might not give the best desirable results, but I do find Cavity does some pretty cool stuff if you want to generate um, a spec map as well, or oh, even spec map as well. So if we just go to, um, I love how I can't see my tabs. I'll go back to that one, Let's maximize it. So we can even do this one and go map converter and we can go um, specular. This one's pretty handy, especially getting it into Unreal. And you see they give different results. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use um, the specular or the uh, the cavity map, etc. for those specific tasks. But ultimately, every one of these you create, as you can see, the specular actually gave me some pretty cool stylized results, is you can go in here and you can adjust it. So you can change the, the depth, pull around just like an NDO and you have your cool um, object looking cool it looks actually looks 3d now so what I'm gonna do is I'll just save this off I'm just gonna file save as and I'm gonna call this like unreal and we'll just go to Targa I'm going to call this TXT for texture and we'll call this like diffuse, even though it was a generate from spec. Why not? Uh, we'll go to the normal wherever it has gone. This is here. So I'll go file, save as we'll save this off as a TGA. Once again, I picked TGAs because they're just uh, generally a good format and we'll call this TXT uh, norm normal and save. Now, if I go into Unreal, so this is Unreal that I had running in the background, probably why things were crashing maybe, because of all the stuff going on. Um, I should put it into a proper folder structure, but for just the purpose of this, I'll just import them in and show you what it looks like. So we'll just go right click and we will go import into this location. We'll go to my folder, get these two silly textures, import them in. Um, automatically Unreal should automatically detect that this is a normal map and it will detect that that's a texture. So it'll generally, as you see when I'm hovering over it, you can see compression settings, this is normal map. If that is different and didn't do it properly, you can double click on it and go onto the settings and change it to, um, to the correct uh, grouping of textures. In other words, it should be normal. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on the, the texture diffuse and I'm going to go create material. 
I call this mat underscore um, wall. And when we've got that open, I'm just going to double click on my material. It's gonna open up everything. I'm just gonna drag in my normal map. If you right clicked on the normal map and went uh, create material off it, uh, it creates the texture node incorrectly and it doesn't think it's a normal map, so it freaks out a little bit. So if I just maximize this, we can see this is our um, object. I'll just make it square so we can see it. So there's our texture. As soon as all we need to do is just load into the normals. And it's probably going to have a bit of a, a problem with how I've baked in bits of the, the shadow into it. So we can actually always just rip that off as for a demonstration, but it should be working. If you hold down L inside of the uh, viewport, you can change the lighting. You can see it looks 3D. Awesome. So I'm going to hit save. And I'm nearly done, guys. I promise. <laughs> For like, just, just keep this going. <laughs> All right. And I'm just going to grab, uh, uh, yeah, we'll just go with a box, a cube. Hopefully the unwrap on this cube is fantastic. And I'm going to drag my material onto the cube. And if we just grab a light specifically, as you'll see it more apparent. Now, if I just roll it past our object, you can see it has the illusion that it's 3D. And our normal map has successfully worked in engine. And you can just hit play, run over to it. Even though that the light isn't really animating or moving, we can see it has the illusion that it looks 3D, but it's not actually. So if you put some more, uh, I guess, more time into the actual texturing rather than just the normal map process that I've just done here, um, you get a really interesting, desirable result. And yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much it. So you can just import your models from here. So other than that, guys, I think that's pretty much it for the, the live stream. Uh, I guess apologies that it was it seemed to not connect properly at the beginning, but um, uh, it all worked out in the end. So yeah, cool. So hopefully we'll be able to do some more of these in the future with different individuals and different disciplines, and probably take this up to the next level with discipline. So I'm going to end the stream now, guys. So I thank you very much for attending, um, and I've got to go to the end slide now. So that's it. So if you'd like to find more about uh, I guess making games, doing VFX, programming. What, what, what not? Um, I recommend you to check out the Australia and all the US campuses, depending where you're located, I guess, wherever you're watching this video. And of course, we also have the online division, which I'm a part of, that you can study online if you can't make it to the campuses. So thank you guys very much. And I'm actually going to close down the meeting and I'll see you guys next time. See you guys.